Hi, my name's Kim. I'm a licensed and nationally certified East Asian medical provider and a Taoist practitioner. In clinic, I deal with COVID, all things COVID. So from long haulers to vax injury to COVID. And whenever there's a disease that crops up that has the potential to be similar to COVID-19, I get curious. There are so many things that have happened with the avian flu that have raised red flags, yet the science that we need to understand what's transpired hasn't happened yet. And now that it's jumped into cattle, one of the questions for me has been, how did cattle get avian flu? Before we get started, one of the things that we need to acknowledge is the amount of effort that industry and government did to make sure that the contamination of our milk supply was contained and to validate that we are not contaminating our meat supply. So there's been a tremendous amount of work and I imagine it's been very stressful and overwhelming for everybody involved. And I don't want to take that away from them, but I do want to say that, hey, all that work hasn't taken away my question on is poultry manure, could that be a possible vector of transmission? And so here's the, here's everything that's out there right now and why this might be something that we would want to look into further so that we don't have the same issue happening later on in our meat or dairy supply. What got me looking into this was that the government, social media, and industry has one of two narratives that it has a tendency to feed us. And the first one is what I call herdable feedback. And that's a fear-based narrative that stampedes us into a certain direction. And then the second narrative is the lullaby narrative where they give us all this information to kind of lull us to sleep. And then we miss the fact that this is actually a pretty significant event. So in March of 2024, the outbreak of Avian flu in Texas cattle is announced and the USDA, they researched this and they think the infections may have started as early as October through December of 2023. You know, that report, when I read that, that kind of gave me this PTSD flashback because it was so similar to how COVID-19 had started. We had heard about the virus a little bit at the end of December of 20, 2019. And then in January of 2020, we really started hearing about it. When they researched it, they think that the initial outbreak could have happened as early as October or November of 2019. And the other thing that was interesting is that just like COVID-19, the USDA thinks that avian flu could have silent carriers in cattle. So asymptomatic cattle or asymptomatic infections in cattle that are still contagious. And that's very much like COVID-19 where they think that 50% of the infections are asymptomatic. What's the backstory on H5N1? Well, it's been around globally since 1996. There has never been a transmission from wild birds to cattle. Cattle have never had avian flu. And up until about a month ago, social media and the news was saying that mammals, so sea lions, bears, cats, they were getting infected because they ate an infected wild bird. And I don't think don't think cows are eating dead birds. Okay, so let's go back to my first episode on avian flu, a few bad actors. And we find out that the initial infection appears to be transmitted from a chicken factory farm that 
didn't notify authorities that they had an outbreak of avian flu and they took feed from that farm and fed it to the wild cranes, infecting the wild cranes. Now, there's another twist in this that also comes from chicken factory farms. I didn't know that we allow chicken manure, which is called poultry litter, in cattle feed. And this has been a feed practice since about 1980. It was implemented as a low-cost feed source and an easy way to eliminate chicken manure. Now, what ends up happening is around 1997, we have this outbreak of mad cow disease, which causes uh, crutchfeld jacob disease. And what they found when they looked at it, the USDA finds that we're feeding cow bone meal and we're feeding the spine and the brain to cattle and cattle feed. And that that is what is causing the mad cow disease. Well, because of the risk to human health, the FDA bans meat byproducts in feed for cattle. That whole discussion on mad cow disease put a spotlight on the practice of feeding chicken manure to cattle. And why that is, is because we actually feed cow bone meal and meat byproducts to chickens. Chickens don't completely digest everything they eat. And there was a concern that because they're not digesting everything, by feeding them their feces, it was another way that cows had the potential to get mad cow disease. So in 2003, the FDA places a ban on the practice of feeding chicken manure to cattle. And the feedback from the cattle industry is, you know, there's not any science to prove that cattle will get mad cow disease from eating chicken manure. And the FDA and industry compromise, and the agreement is that they'll remove all the parts that are believed to contain the virus of mad cow disease, which is the spinal cord and the brain, although some countries believe it's also in the bone. So they'll remove the spinal cord and the brain from chicken feed. And when they did that, when industry did that, the FDA approved the practice of feeding chicken manure to cattle in 2005. So here's a statement from industry, and this would be the cattle industry. FDA has mandated the removal of all tissues that have been shown to carry infectious agents of BSE, and that's mad cow disease, from poultry diets. As a result, the practical possibility of transmitting mad cow disease to beef cattle via poultry litter was deemed to be zero by the FDA. And poultry litter was again approved as a feedstuff for beef cattle in October of 2005. Here's the thing. I didn't realize this. Factory farming is feeding a lot of chicken manure in cattle. So this is from a 2009 university recommendation. Their recommendation for feeding this to cattle was 70% chicken manure to 30% hay. That seems like a lot. Just to recap, in 1997 is where we start to see the outbreak of mad cow disease. And it's not just in the United States, it's happening over in the UK also and other countries. So there was a real push to figure out what was causing this. The end result was that our trading partners, Canada and the European Union, completely banned the practice of feeding poultry manure to cattle because of their concerns for safety and the concerns that poultry manure can transmit hoof and mouth disease and mad cow disease. 
we were the only nation left standing feeding poultry manure to cattle. Well, the United States is the last country that believes feeding poultry manure to cattle is safe. And the question really is, is feeding chicken manure to cattle safe? Hmm. Well, this debate hasn't stopped. And even with the removal of the cow brain and the cow spinal tissue from chicken feed products, scientists continue to voice concerns over the ability of chicken manure to pass on diseases. And there's a lot of information that disease is spread through fecal matter. There's a lot of research on human feces. Our whole sewer system is based on the dangers of fecal waste. And if we go back to chicken manure spreading disease, all farmers know about the risk of histoplasmosis from chicken manure, and that is a lung fungus that gets into your lungs and it can be deadly. You can pass disease through chicken manure, but can you pass avian flu through chicken manure? When it comes to avian flu, there is an documented evidence that avian flu can be passed to other species through untreated chicken manure. And that 2003 avian flu outbreak, there was a farm in Korea that had magpies spending time in an area holding infected chicken feces. Later, some of the magpies, they're found dead on the farm and they became infected through the chicken feces. So now we know that chicken manure, it does spread diseases. It does seem to spread avian flu. Well, what is in chicken manure? And there was a 2019 research study on using chicken manure as organic food fertilizer in your gardens. So this is raw untreated chicken manure. And here is what the scientists found. The key safety concerns of chicken litter are its contamination with pathogens, including bacteria, fungi, helmets, which are worms, parasitic protozoa and viruses. So that's all the natural world. And then there's the man-made world of antibiotics and antibiotic resistant genes, growth hormones, such as egg and meat boosters, heavy metals, and pesticides. So pretty much everything can be found in chicken manure. And then the authors went on to explain, there is very little science on the use of chicken manure. Despite the paucity of literature about chicken litter safety for land application, the existing information was scattered and disjointed in various sources, thus making them not easily accessible and difficult to interpret. Yet even with all of that, they were able to find enough information to suggest that raw chicken litter does not meet the minimum standards for application as organic fertilizer. I found even less information when I went to find research that focused on the contaminants in chicken manure and their potential effects on livestock. Okay, so now we can see, yeah, a lot of diseases in chicken manure. Yeah, information that it is spread through chicken feces. What about, what about the FDA and industry? What are they saying right now? And this whole outbreak is really recent. So currently there is no evidence of the spread of avian flu through chicken litter. Industry has come out strongly stating that the USDA and the FDA have not found a link between avian food and the feeding of chicken manure to cattle. Today, there's just not enough information to say how avian flu is spreading to dairy cattle. Some of the infections have been linked to the movement of cattle between different farms, but other farms have had outbreaks of avian flu without a connection to a previously infected farm. There was an article published recently, and this article looks like it was published by industry, and they identify Texas as ground zero, and they also identify the presence of dead wild birds on some of the farms in the area. And they say that the geese 
the migrating geese are the carriers and that they are the ones that have infected the cattle. But there's no science, right, to say that. And I've looked through and I've heard that they might have found one wild bird that had this strain, but I can't find that article again. And I haven't seen anything about that since. They have found chickens that have a similar strain, but they haven't found it in wild birds. So in my avian flu episode part two, where I talk about how this has gotten so deadly in our mammals in the oceans, there was all these sea lions dying off the coast of San Diego. And there was assumption that a commonly occurring toxic algae was the cause of this really unusual deaths of hundreds of sea lions and about 60 dolphins. But there was no science on that. And I think it was Thomas Gillespie. He's an ecologist. Was it from Emory University? But what his statement was that, you know, we haven't done any science on this, but, you know, one plus one equals two. We're pretty com comfortable that because there's this toxic algae, that that had to be the cause. But the question is, was that the cause? And I think we're in that same situation here is we're not finding this strain in the wild bird population. We're finding it in chickens. At least we're not finding it reported in the wild bird population. And right now there's assumption that these wild geese that were migrating were the ones who uh, gave the cattle this avian flu. Okay, so let's look at that statement in more depth. If wild birds did transmit avian flu to cattle, and it's been around since the end of last year, shouldn't we expect to see other cattle across the globe infected with avian flu? I mean, that's how it's worked in all the other species right now. It seems reasonable that we would see that because this strain of avian flu transfers across the globe so quickly. So maybe we should see it in Mexico or Canada. Well, as of May 10th, so this is, it, the outbreak was in March, April, May, so a month and a half maybe. As of May 10th, 2024, there are no confirmed cases a bird flu in cows beyond U.S. borders. And here's the thing. If we think about these Canadian geese, these Canadian geese, they have flown through Canada and they have flown through Mexico. And neither of these countries have an outbreak of avian flu in cattle. If you think about it, blaming wild birds for the transmission of avian flu into cattle really doesn't pass the smell test. There's one other thing that I had noticed is that industry, they're not saying that they're not feeding poultry manure to dairy cattle. What they're saying is, well, if they are feeding it, it, it wouldn't be a lot. And that's interesting for a lot of reasons. But now this is a Texas panhandle where this avian flu has outbroke, right? And Remember in February of this year, so just the month before this outbreak, we had these huge wildfires in the panhandle that consume thousands of acres. So part of the concern is there is not going to be the grazing land for these dairy cattle. And without that grazing land, are they being forced to purchase feed in order to keep their cattle? And it's just a thought. I don't know, but it makes sense because, you know, avian flu has been around for a couple of years. We haven't had this problem previously. Maybe in previous years when they had grazing, there wasn't a problem. Yet this year, I mean, they're getting hit with a lot this year. And a decision to feed poultry manure may have been just one more bad decision. Who knows? I don't know. This is just all speculation and this is just based on what's happened and what's being said. So 
What if we looked at how they process chicken manure for cattle? Because that also gives you some interesting insights into what might be happening here. When they're processing chicken manure for cattle feed, one of their suggestions is, hey, bring it down to a 4.7 pH. So make it really acidic. And they're hoping that by doing that, that you're going to kill the virus. So that kind of struck me because it almost sounded like a killed virus in a vaccine, right? A killed virus in a vaccine is an inactivated virus is what it's called. And you can find that in our polio vaccines and our whooping cough vaccines. Now, what's interesting is this avian flu, the older cattle were the ones that were getting sick and they all recovered and they're considered healthy and ready to produce milk again. And they're being tested for any signs of the virus. If they show the virus, their milk is going to be destroyed. Part of me is wondering, did we feed these cattle an inactivated virus and that gave them some immunity to this avian food? flu. We fed it to them. So they got infected. They probably wouldn't have gotten infected if we didn't feed it to them, but we fed it to them. They got infected, but because it was a killed virus, their response was mild at best. And what was interesting too, it's the older cattle were the ones that got sicker. And I remember the mink farms in the United States, they didn't call the mink that got COVID and they found it was the older ones that got sicker and the younger ones were fine. So this avian flu has some similar characteristics to that kind of infection. Kind of interesting, huh? And if we look back in history, remember the, the smallpox vaccine? That was actually found because dairy maids were being exposed to pox from cows when they were milking them. And dairy maids knew if they got infected with the pox from cows that they wouldn't get sick with smallpox. So they were exposed to a less deadly virus and that saved them from smallpox. I think that's interesting. The whole thing's just kind of an interesting hypothesis. Yet the science that we need to identify what's happened here it doesn't look like that's going to happen. So let me read to you from an article. I believe this is from the from industry. Farmers want answers that would come with further research. But the spirit of collaboration that existed in the first months of the Texas outbreak has fractured. Federal restrictions have triggered a backlash from farmers who find them unduly punishing given that pasteurized milk and cooked beef from dairy cattle appear to pose no risk to consumers. And here's the thing, that's another thing that we haven't tested. They're making an assumption that this killed virus in the milk would not cause a problem. There's no science to prove that yet. And here's another piece of that article. Texas Agriculture Commissioner Sid Miller said that when he heard that federal agents with the CDC and the USDA were considering visits to farms, including those farms where farmers reported the cattle had recovered, he advised against it. Send federal agents to dairies that's not sick, he said. That doesn't pass a smell test. Hmm. Okay. The thing is, the recommendation is that you don't feed poultry litter to dairy cattle. And it seems more likely poultry litter is the cause of the outbreak just because of the economics that's going on in the panhandle right now. And it seems reasonable to hypothesize that the infection in cattle was less deadly than it has been in any other species because it was a killed virus. Yet, if it was from poultry litter, that would confirm scientists' concerns that poultry litter is a contaminated food source capable of doing great harm. And I imagine that's a huge concern in the cattle industry. Let's hypothesize it was poultry litter. This avian flu has characteristics that are similar to COVID-19. 
if we continue to feed poultry litter to cattle and this avian flu continues to drift and rapidly mutate, will it create even more severe forms of avian flu in cattle? And the economics of poultry litter is being challenged because the use of poultry litter in our beef industry has already become a trade issue as early as 2018 with the European Union importing less of our beef because we feed poultry litter. With this outbreak of avian flu, can Canada and Colombia have placed restrictions on the movement of cattle from the United States. And here's an interesting one. Mexico is in the process today of removing restrictions on beef exports. So beef from the United States going to Mexico due to the mad cow issue in 1997. So they've had restrictions on what kind of cattle could be Im exported from the United States and imported into Mexico from the United States since 1997 and the mad cow issue. And so they're working through removing those restrictions at last. And just in time, we have this huge avian flu outbreak in our beef industry. Well, I hope that kind of highlights how incredibly complicated this issue is and that there's so many different people and parties involved. There's government, there's industry, there's you and me, the consumer. And, you know, how do we get to a point where everybody's concerns are addressed? Who knows? I'm glad I'm not the one trying to figure this out. Okay, until next time, I'll catch you on the other side.